Lord, I thank you for your grace. Lord, I thank you for your mercy. Lord, I even thank you for the difficult times of life. Lord, as I, I think everybody here has gone through a season recently, Lord. Um, and coming through it, Lord, I, I, I can honestly say thank you. I didn't always say thank you in the process, but I thank you now. And Lord, I thank you that you yourself in walking this earth experience difficult times as well. But Father, please, um, as a compassionate Father, again I pray, please speak to our hearts tonight in your word, by your spirit, amen. Amen. Can you believe that it's the first day of school coming up this week? How many of you are blessed for that? Well, we've got no kids in here tonight, obviously, and, and the homeschoolers have already started, right? So, well, I, I recently heard about a teacher who was hired to teach English 101 in the state prison system. On the first day of class, not knowing where his students were at in terms of English grammar, he asked them a question. He said, who here knows what a sentence is? <laughs> I think that's so clever, personally. I didn't come up with it, you know, but... I think that's just so well said. And of course, I, you know, I worked in that, in that part of society anyway. You know, the first day of school is always a difficult one. And perhaps you remember your first day of school. I remember my first day of first grade. It was actually my third year of school because my mother put me in pre-K and then in kindergarten. She would do anything to get rid of me. But my first day of first grade was my first day of riding the bus. And so I got my cool, you remember the old uh, metal lunch boxes that you had, you know, with the matching thermos inside. And I got on the bus and some third grade kid, I don't remember his name or even his face anymore, said something to me and I hauled off and I punched him and a, and a fight ensued and I got a bloody nose and blood all over my beautiful shirt with little bicycles all over it. My first day of school. Now, that blood was probably a positive thing if you consider the kind of clothes we wore in the 70s. That was 1973. <coughs> first day of school is always a difficult one. And here in Genesis chapter 28, 28 we look at, at Jacob because Jacob is now about to go to school. But his school is the school of hard knocks and it's located 500 miles north-northeast in northern Mesopotamia. So we pick up actually at chapter 27, verse 46. Then we'll move into chapter 28. 27, 46 says this, And Rebekah said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob takes a wife of the daughters of Heth like these, who are the, da who are the daughters of the land, what good will my life be to me? Now, you remember last week when we looked at Jacob and his twin and older brother Esau, we saw there was some bad blood that was brewing between them. Jacob had, had tricked his, his elderly father into giving him the patriarchal blessing rather than his older brother who his father felt should have actually received that blessing. Nevertheless, his mother put him up to deceiving his father. He disguised himself as Esau. He received the blessing from his father. And then Esau came in, and of course the whole thing broke open. Suddenly, it was evident what had happened. Now Esau has planned revenge. Isaac thinks he's going to die. And so he says, well, as soon as dad is gone, then I'm going to go ahead and kill my brother. Now Rebecca's heard this. She's overheard that, that he has you know, revenge planned. And so she says to her son, if you look in the last part of that chapter, you know, um, we need to get you out of here. Your brother wants to kill you and we're going to have to send you away for a few days. Now, what we're picking up here in verse 46 is a conversation that she's having with her husband. You see, J Jacob's brother, Esau, was a very carnal man. We spoke about him before. He was the guy who would actually trade away his inheritance for a bowl of stew. He was a guy who married a couple of Canaanite girls in the land, which was the last thing that Abraham's descendants were supposed to do. And so Rebecca says to her husband, Isaac, she says, listen, we, we need to send Jacob away. 
He needs to get a wife. And I don't want him marrying from the, from the local girls. The, the, these aren't the kind of gals we want in the family. So, they decide they're going to send him away. But what this really is, is a sanitized version of sending him away because of his brother's revenge. You understand that? They're sending him away because his brother wants to kill him. But at the same time, they don't want him to marry foolishly, so they're going to send him up to the family up there and say, hey, you know, perhaps you can find yourself a wife up there. Esau had married a couple of Canaanite girls, and obviously that was a huge distress to Rebecca. Rebecca even says here, you know, um, what good will my life be to me? Or the idea is, what good is going to come of this? What is our lives going to amount to if our sons are marrying Canaanite girls? You see, as I, as I mentioned last week, you know, your, your choice of a spouse does affect your families, doesn't it? And most of when you got married probably had some of that in-law junk going on where, you know, mother-in-laws didn't like sons-in-laws and father-in-laws didn't like daughter-in-laws and all that kind of stuff. Because this is why, and I, I'm going to keep hitting this thing on marriage because you could do all your marriage counseling out of the book of Genesis. You really could. Because if there's any mistake made, it's already made in the very first book of the Bible. Marriage is really the uniting of families, not just two people. See, when I married into my wife, when I married my wife, I married into her family. When she married me, she married into my family, and that's a different story, you see. <clears throat> There's different things that different dynamics that go on, and so when you choose, you want to choose well, right? You don't want to cause problems in the family. And you know, young people, I can't say this enough, sometimes them older people people you call your parents really know what's going on. They really do have some, some experience behind them, and they don't just say stuff just to make you mad. But they actually have some good wisdom. So choose well, because it will affect your family. I heard of a man in his mid-30s who, who ran into an old friend one day, and his, his, old, his friend said, gee, are you married now? And he says, well, no, actually, I've met several women that I've wanted to marry, But when I bring them home to meet my parents, my mother doesn't like them. His friend said, gee, that's a tough place to be. He says, well, let me give you some advice. Just marry a woman who's exactly like your mother. He says, gee, you know, I should probably do that. Well, you know, they talk for a bit and they walk off. And a few months later, they run into each other again. And his friend says, gee, you know, did you, did you ever meet the right girl? And he says, you know, I met the perfect girl. She's just like my mother. And his friend said, why didn't you marry her? And he says, well, because now my father doesn't like her. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> Marriage affects families. I can't say that enough. So Rebecca suggests that Jacob be sent away and find a woman from her side of the family, you see. Just as Abraham had arranged for Isaac 60 years previous to this. The last thing that she wanted to do was for Jacob to follow in his older brother's footsteps. Now, chapter 28, verse 1. Then Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said to him, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and take yourself a wife from there of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you, that you may be an assembly of peoples and give you the blessing of Abraham to you and your descendants with you, that you may inherit the land in which you are a stranger, which God gave to Abraham. So Isaac sent Jacob away, and he went to Padan Aram to Laban, the son of Bethuel, the Syrian, the brother of Rebekah, the mother of Jacob and Esau. So Isaac takes his son Jacob. He, he charges him, whatever you do, do not marry a Canaanite girl. Instead, go to Padanaram, go to see your mother's side of the family. It's 500 miles away, but you know, you'll find a wife there, no doubt. And with that, he sends him off. But not only does he charge him not to marry of the local girls, he also blesses him with the blessings <coughs> excuse me, of the Abrahamic covenant. And this time, it was voluntary. He wasn't being tricked into giving the blessing. This time, he actually he repeats those things over him. And that blessing involved three things. It involved descendants. 
God had promised Abraham that he would make him a multitude of nations, not just a multitude in a nation, but a multitude of nations. It was a promise of land as well. And then, of course, there was God's general blessing in his life, and those were the three components of the Abrahamic blessing. Previously, Isaac was tricked into giving it to Jacob. Now he sort of pronounces it over him voluntarily as he sends him on his way. It seems to me that Isaac has probably come to terms with the fact that he was acting really against God's will. That God had said that the older would serve the younger, but Isaac determined to bless the older instead of the younger. Now it seems he's come to terms with that. You know, life has a way of doing that, doesn't it? Of kind of looking back and and reviewing things and thinking, gee, I thought I was so right in those years, and now as I look back, I'm like, gee, I don't know if I was so right now. I think when we're young, late teens, early 20s for guys, I don't know for girls, but I can tell you personally as a man, those late teens, early 20s, you become so idealistic, full of idealism, not a lot of wisdom to go with it. And and so many things that you thought you were so right about, you look back now and you just realize were issues of preference and issues of perspective. And here's a man who's 100 years old now, over 100, at least 100 right now, Isaac is. And he's looking back and he's saying, you know, well, I guess I probably had that one wrong. Maybe that one wasn't so right. I think that's probably one of the redeeming things about this earthly pilgrimage. Isn't all the right things that I do in the here and now, it's looking back and realizing how many things were wrong and and still God never abandoned me. That's what I'm really finding out. Before it was all about doing and doing and doing, right? When you were young. Now as you start to get older, it's about reflecting and reflecting. It's about wisdom now. It's not about brute force. Well, verse 6, we pick up with Esau. Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Padan Aram to take himself a wife from there. And that as he blessed him, he gave him a charge saying, you shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. And Jacob had obeyed his father and his mother and had gone to Padan Aram. Also Esau saw that the daughters of Canaan did not please his father Isaac. So Esau went to Ishmael and took Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebaioth, to be his wife in addition to the wives he had. So Esau, still angry about his brother's manipulation, sees his father, bless his brother, send his brother off. He sees his brother's obedience. He sees that his own two wives, the Canaanite girls, are not particularly uh, kosher in his father's eyes. And so he says, you know, I should probably do better. Let me marry a third woman, and I'll marry from within the family too. And so he marries an Ishmaelite, which... Technically, I mean, Ishmael was Abraham's son. He's marrying from within the family, but he's marrying in the wrong side of the family. You see, there's a consequence for Jacob's decisions, Jacob's deceit, and his mother's deceit, and that is he's being sent away. Esau is about to feel the consequences as well, not of deceit, but of a lack of spirituality. He doesn't care about spiritual things. And so he says, oh, I married from outside the family. My parents aren't very happy, so let me marry from within the family, but really missing the point in the, in the beginning that that side of the family was not to really be closer. That's why Abraham sent Ishmael away. The heartbreaking thing about Esau here is he's trying to do the right thing, but he doesn't have a heart for the things of God, and so the right things that he does are really wrong. That's a difficult pill to swallow. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 8 says this, The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. So even if I'm a wicked person, if I want to sacrifice for the Lord, as a wicked person, I give all kinds of money to the church and fund all kinds of mission, whatever, in God's eyes, it's no good. It's an abomination. Why? Because I don't have the right heart in the first place. Doing all the right things but not having the right heart is being wrong in the eyes of God. And that's exactly what's going on here with Esau. He doesn't have a heart for the things of God, so when he tries to do good things, he actually falls short. 
See, the lesson of these first nine verses is this, is that you are true, it, it is true, you are absolutely free to make your choices, but you are bound to the consequences of those choices. There's a whole generation of people that want to have their freedom and not experience the consequences that go with those choices they make. It's a heartbreaking thing. You can choose what you want. God will not force you to choose anything. But whatever choices you make, you get the consequences with them for good or for bad. The story of a pig who was eating a bunch of acorns under an oak tree. And then he started to sort of dig around the roots of this oak tree, trying to find more and more acorns. Finally, a crow flies up and says, you know, you shouldn't do this. If you lay the roots bare, you'll kill the tree. The pig says, well, let it die. Who cares as long as there are acorns? And, and, and it seems strange to me that that's the way a lot of people are living. Is it just my imagination? Or do you see it too? That people are living for the here and the now and the here and the now. And the here and now doesn't give them what they want. It gives them what they don't want in the end. But to have a heart for God and to live for the things of God. And, and, and Jacob is going to get God's blessing in his life. Is Jacob a good guy? He's a manipulator. He's deceitful. But he has a heart for spiritual things. If you look at Jacob and Esau, Esau seems to be the guy who has more integrity. But Jacob has a heart for the things of God. And Jacob is the one who's going to go to school now because of it. God's going to radically change his life. So we look at consequences 101 in the first nine verses. Now we look at encouragement 101. Verse 10. Now Jacob went out from Beersheba and went towards Haran. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head, and he lay down in that place to sleep. So Jacob is on the move now. He's left home. As we'll see, he's in the area of Luz, or what he would call, later call Bethel, which is 50 miles away. So he's made it about 10% of his journey. He's probably done a 50-mile sort of forced march. He's absolutely exhausted. It's been two days typically to get that far. And now he's bedded down for the night, decides to get some sleep. And so what does he pick up? A big rock to lay his head on. Now, how tired do you have to be to pull up a rock and say, oh, here's a good pillow. I think I'll use this. I, I know I've had some pillows in my time that you might describe as a rock, but I've never had a rock that you would call a pillow. In fact, I remember I'm going to get really personal here. This won't go out over the air. I'm going to trust you guys to edit this. But when I was a kid, I had one of those pillows that was so flat. Do you know the pillow I'm talking about? It, it started out somewhere like this, probably with my great-great-great-grandfather. But as it just made its way through the family over the years, it just completely depressed. And, and you'd think my parents would have got me a new pillow after sleeping on my teddy bear for like 20 years. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> that became my pillow as a kid, you know. Well, anyway, that's probably a bit too personal. But he pulls up a rock, and he lays his head down on it, and he begins to close his eyes. Verse 12, then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to heaven, and there were the angels of God, uh, and there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And so they're exhausted, sound asleep, his head on a rock. Jacob has a dream. And in this dream, we read of this ladder. The word literally here means a stairway. You guys have ever heard the term stairway to heaven? Yeah, that's where it's, this is, that comes from. It's Jacob's dream here. This is a stairway, not a ladder, but a stairway to heaven. So he sees this stairway, and on it he sees the, the angels moving up and down on it. Now you might wonder, what is that really about? Well, Jesus actually in John chapter 1 gives us the interpretation of it. Let's go to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verse 47. We read this. Jesus saw... Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite in whom is no deceit. Now, Nathanael is approaching to Jesus. Jesus identifies him. Hey, here's, you know, here's a Jew who isn't deceitful. Now, what was Jacob? 
deceitful, right? Keep that in mind. <clears throat> Next verse. Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael's response would be like anybody else's. Okay, so who are you and how do you know who I am? Jesus says to him, hey, I, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip went to get you in the first place. You see, it was typical of a young Jewish man as he was studying the Torah to sit underneath, <clears throat> excuse me, to sit underneath a fig tree. And Philip must have been studying the scriptures. And I, I, I strongly suspect that he was studying this account of Jacob. Because the first thing Jesus says is, behold, an Israelite in whom there is no guile. And Jesus says, I saw you under the fig tree. So he's alluding to the fact that he was studying the Torah. So not only did he know who Nathaniel was, but he knew where Nathaniel had, where Nathaniel had come from, didn't he? Verse 49, Nathaniel answered him and said to him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And with that revelation, then, Nathaniel became aware of who it was who stood before him. Not just the Messiah King, but the Son of God himself. And then Jesus says this in verses 50 and 51. Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe me? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, Hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. See, Jesus is referencing the same dream that Jacob is having in the book of Genesis. And Jesus is saying, the Son of Man, you just called me. That's who I am. I am the, the staircase. I am this ladder. I am the go-between between between heaven and earth. That's what Jesus is saying to him here. So we understand that Nathaniel had been studying about Jacob. And Jesus comes to him. And, and begins this conversation with him based on his study of the Scripture. So Jesus says, I am that go-between between heaven and earth. He said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Nobody comes to the Father. What? Well, what happens if I live a good life? What happens if I'm a, generally a good person? How about I gave to the bishop's fund? I did... Good things for the homeless. Do I not need the stairway to heaven? Do I not need Jesus? See, he said, nobody comes to the Father except through me. He doesn't say, you know, no one comes to the Father except through good works. And I think, you know, growing up the way I did before I, I began to read the Bible itself, I was always taught that my good works kind of moved me up the ladder, but that Jesus' death on the cross would bring me over the ladder. It would kind of get me over the top. But the Bible says, no, your good works don't do anything for you. They, they merit a reward in heaven if they're done in faith, but our ability to move from heaven, from earth to heaven is only by the death of Jesus Christ, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Any religious system that tells you your good works account towards your salvation is wrong. They're not teaching you the scripture. Jesus says, I am the way, not a way. The way. There's only one way. And who is it? And he's the stairway to heaven. Not Robert Plant. Not Jimmy Page. Jesus Christ is the stairway to heaven. That's why... In John chapter 19, on the cross, he said, it is finished. There's nothing you can add to what he did for you on the cross. Amen? Verse 13, and behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Also, your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and the east, to the north and the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. So he's having this dream. 
He sees heaven. He sees this staircase between heaven and earth. He sees the angels moving up and down. And then he hears the voice of God speak to him. And the Lord says, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. So he clearly identifies himself to Jacob and lets Jacob know who he is. God's identifying himself, but he's also identifying Jacob at the same time. Isn't that what Jesus did with Nathanael? Behold an Israelite in whom there is no guile. And there Nathanael has a revelation of who God is. Then he says, the land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. That's part of the Abrahamic covenant. Again, that promise of the land. A place of their own. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and the south. So there's that promise of a multitude of descendants, part of the Abrahamic covenant again. He says, and in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Isn't that the third component of the Abrahamic covenant? So first, Isaac was tricked into giving it to Jacob. Then he voluntarily gave it to Jacob. And now God affirms it to Jacob. And by the way, that covenant between God and the Jewish people remains to this day. God's never... uh, called that that covenant null and void. That still remains true. And God said, you know, you'll be a blessing to all the families of the earth. It was really interesting. I was doing some reading. You know, you guys are familiar with the Nobel Prizes, right? Alfred Nobel created dynamite. He created it for the purposes of mining. Of course, men took dynamite and made bombs (laughs) because that's what human nature does. And so Alfred Nobel took this Huge, the millions of dollars that he had made in producing dynamite, he then put in, um, in uh, endowments, and they're given out as the Nobel Prizes. There are prizes for economics, medicine, physics, chemistry, literature, and peace. Now, we understand that the Jewish population on this earth is one-fifth of one percent. So, 0.2% is, is the amount of Jews in the whole world, right, in terms of percentages. One-fifth of one percent. But regarding Nobel Prizes in economics, 41% of people who've won that have been Jewish. Nobel Prizes for medicine, 28% of the people who received those were Jews. In terms of physics, 26%. Chemistry, 19%. Literature, 13% and Nobel Peace Prizes, 9% of them have been Jewish. Is that strange? That's highly disproportionate. Now, am I saying that Jewish people are somehow special? No. They're made of the same corrupt water and sand that we are. But God had made a covenant that he would bless the whole world through them. That's primarily with the gospel, but not exclusively. So I only make that point to say that God's still true to his promises. And then beyond the Abrahamic covenant, when God speaks to him in this dream, he says this, Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. Now when God says things like this, like, I'll be with you and I will keep you wherever you go, I have to ask, why would God say that? Why would God say to Jacob, Jacob, understand this, I'm never going to leave you. I'm going to accomplish what I've determined to accomplish in your life. See, God has appeared to Jacob for the purpose of encouraging him. Because God knows what the future holds, but Jacob doesn't. Jacob thinks he's going to leave for a short time and go to Padan Aram and find a wife and come back. That's what he thinks is going to happen because that's what his mother had said to him. Just go for a few days. But it's not going to be a few days. God's plan was a lot different. See, Jacob will be gone for over 20 years. He'll come back with four wives, not just one. He'll have 12 kids and he'll, he'll actually have a limp also. He will be a totally different person. See, God appears to Jacob 
primarily for the purpose of encouraging him. Encouragement's a powerful thing. It's never been my thing. If you try to encourage me, I'll be like, yeah, 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 sure, okay. You know, you, you understand. I don't take compliments very well. Some of you are like that. I know I'm not the only one. And yet, in complimenting people, it's amazing how much more motivated people are when they're encouraged, especially when they're going through difficult times. Jacob is going to go to the school of hard knocks. I was in high school for four years. I had some friends who did it for five years. But he's going to go for 20 years. And it's not going to be easy. But God appears to him and says, listen, I will be with you wherever you go. And the things that I've purposed to accomplish in you, I am going to accomplish them. Paul said the same thing in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. He says, he who began a good work in you will be Faithful to complete it until the day of Christ. Till the day he takes you home, he'll be faithful to complete what he started in your life. And I pray that for you, that's an encouragement. Don't forget, times are hard. The world's absolutely insane. My mother-in-law asked me today, did you watch the news? I said, no, that's the last thing I want to do before I preach. (laughs) But I remember this one thing, that God will be faithful to do what he said he will do. He does encourage, and encouragement is a powerful thing. i got a lot of stories tonight. There's a story of a guy who opened up his front door one morning to get his newspaper, and there was a little scrappy dog with a newspaper in his mouth just sitting there at the door. The guy was like, wow, that's strange. But he, he took the newspaper from the dog, and he threw the dog a dog treat and sent the dog on his way and closed it. The next morning he woke up, there were eight newspapers right there and a little dog, you know. <laughs> Because it's the power of encouragement, you know. And when, when, when you hear God say, hey, listen, I'm in your corner, I'm behind you, you can continue to go, you can continue to do the things you know you ought to do, even when it's hard, or even when it's unfair. God will be faithful. So we then looked at Consequences 101. We've looked at Encouragement 101. Now we'll look at Devotion 101, verse 16. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob awakes from his dream and realizes that it was more than just a dream. It was a legitimate vision he had, not just some bad shawarma. All right? And he realizes that in this dream, he's had this personal encounter with God. You understand that Jacob has grown up in a godly family, but it's almost like Jacob here has had his born-again experience. He's had a personal experience with God. And he makes a couple of interesting statements. In terms of his devotion, he makes some declarations. He says, surely the Lord is in this place, and I didn't know it. He says, I didn't realize that I was right here in the presence of God. That's a great thing to realize. It's a scary thing to realize sometimes too that we exist in God's presence, that he doesn't miss a thing. But it's an encouraging thing because in light of my sin, he hasn't abandoned me still, has he? And then he says, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God and this is the gate of heaven. So he's having this spiritual experience, but you understand that he doesn't understand the sort of magnitude of who God is. He's got got God kind of localized the way that I did when I got saved. When I got saved, I saw God within my paradigm. As I've grown in Christ, hopefully some of my paradigm has peeled away and I'm beginning to see things more from his point of view. But but Jacob here has got a localized view of God. But you understand that, that God doesn't exist here exclusively, right? We call this God's house, but really, aren't you God's house? Aren't you the temple? Aren't you the ones that he's fitting together? Sometimes we think about this as God's house, you know. I don't know. I think maybe God might knock it down if it was his, you know. (laughs) You're God's house. 
Isaiah 66, Isaiah says this, Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. That's a pretty big house. He says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my ottoman. That's what he's saying here. Where is the house that you will build for me? Where is the place of my rest? For all those things my hand has made and all those things exist, says the Lord. But on this one I will look on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit who trembles at my word. I like that. I I like those two thoughts together. He says, heaven is my throne. The earth is my footstool. I've made all these things. But let me tell you, says God, the one who who I look upon, and it's the one who has a poor and a broken spirit, the one who is humble and broken inside. He says, that's the one that I'm looking at. That's the one that I'm listening to. You see, Jacob is going to be humbled, and he's going to be broken. We saw his devotion and his declaration. Now we see it in terms of his deeds. Verse 18. Then Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put at his head, set it up as a pillar, and poured oil on top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of that city had been Luz previously. So Jacob not only declares the awesomeness of his experience in that particular location, but he sort of memorializes it. He takes the rock that he'd been sleeping on, he turns it up on its side, and he pours oil on top of it. Essentially, what he's kind of doing is consecrating it by turning the rock up. It's in sort of an unnatural position, pouring oil on it. He's sort of marking it as a, almost a, as a spiritual landmark in his life, and in fact it will be because he'll eventually come back to this place. And then, not only does he mark the place by flipping the rock up and pouring oil on it, but he changes the name of it. Previously, it had been known as Luz, which which really means like hazelnut or almond. And now he says it's the house of God, Beth El. Beth being house and El being God. So he says this is the house of God. So he sort of renames it. Remember, God's given him this land. And from now on the Jewish people will end up calling this Bethel and no longer Luz. And then, verse 20, we look at his devotion in terms of his determination. Then Jacob made a vow saying, If God will be with me and keep me in this way that I am going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set as a pillar shall be God's house, and all that you give me I will surely give you a tenth. So Jacob not only made a memorial, he also made a vow that goes with it. Now, I have to explain something here. In the the New King James, we read this, If God will be with me. That's not really the heart of what's being said here, though. I have to explain that to you. God isn't, uh, Jacob isn't saying, God, if you go with me, then I will do these things. This is better understood as, since God is with me, I will do these things. Does that make sense to you? Sometimes certain words don't translate very well. This is one of those cases. And it preaches really well to say, you know, he's, well, he's a young believer. And as young believers, we said that, God, if you get me out of this trouble, I'll show up to church every Sunday morning. Didn't we do those kind of things? God, if you get me out of this trouble, you know, I'll make sure that I throw a few extra dollars in the basket or whatever. And that preaches really well, that he's an, he's a, an immature believer and so he says these kind of things. That's not really the heart of what's being said here. He's just had this experience. God has showed himself to Jacob and he's, Jacob says, since God will be with me and keep me in the way that I'm going, And since he'll give me bread to eat and clothing to put on, God has promised these things. And because he's going to do it, he says, these are the things I'm going to do. He says, this shall be your house. This will be a place in his life, a landmark where he continues to come back to. And he also says that anything that God gives him, he'll give him a tenth or literally a tithe. Uh Uh-oh, we're going to talk about money. (laughs) <laughs> well, here's the truth. I have people that tell me, Bill, you need to preach about money more often. But I don't. Because I only talk about it when the Scripture talks about it. When the Scripture talks about it, I don't avoid it. Amen? That keeps it well within balance. So here's a couple of ideas regarding the tithe, okay? First of all, it appears before the law, therefore it isn't the law. 
You understand that the law doesn't exist until the time of Moses, several hundred years after this. But the tithe has appeared twice already in Genesis 14 and now here in 28. See, the tithe preceded the law. So when people say, well, that's the law, I don't do that. It's not the law. They just don't know their Bibles. Okay? Also note here that it was voluntarily offered by Abraham and by Jacob. It was not coerced. Did God put a guilt trip on Abraham? Did Melchizedek put a guilt trip on Abraham outside of, uh, outside of Jerusalem? No. Did God put a guilt trip on Jacob here and, and say, listen, I'm doing all these things for you. I want a tenth back. Does he do that? Anyone? No, there's no guilt trip involved here. Right? Third point. It was a tenth. That's the literal meaning of the word tithe. Tithing is not giving. A lot of times in churches today, they, they equate the two. But tithing is not giving. All right? It's giving a tenth. It's giving a specific, a specific percentage. That's what it is, okay? Understand that. Another point, it wasn't given to buy God's favor. And I'll probably make some enemies of some ministries tonight. But I'm not going to tell you that if you tithe, that God's going to give you exactly ten times as much as you put in the basket. I will tell you that Malachi says that if you trust, if you actually test God in this, He'll open up the flood, you know, He'll open up the, the floodgates and the windows of heaven and He'll pour out on you. And I believe that and I've experienced it. But I don't think that God is obligated to give back to us because we give to Him. I don't give to get. If you give to get, you give with a wrong motive and a wrong intention. You're giving out of selfishness, not out of love. And Jacob here isn't giving to get. He's giving because he realizes that God's got his hand firmly upon his life, even though he's a cheater and a swindler and a manipulator. And the fact that he's deceitful, God hasn't abandoned him. God says, hey, I'm going to do great work in your life. Now, I'm a cheater. And I'm a manipulator, and I'm a swindler, and I'm all kinds of things. But when God appears to me and says, listen, I know all that you are, and I know where you've been, and I know what you're doing, but I'm going to do a work in your life, wouldn't you be just blessed? Wouldn't you want to respond out of love? Because that's what Jacob is doing here, is responding out of love. I don't believe that the Bible says, thou must tithe. I believe if you take God at his word, he'll bless you, not because he has to, but because he wants to, and he won't be manipulated. And if you give to get, then don't give it all. God doesn't need your money. But whatever you do, do for for the right reasons. Do simply because of who he is and what he's done, not because of anything you can get out of it. It was never about you and me. It was always about him. And that can't be preached too much in churches today. We've just got to start getting pure with our motives. And just saying, Lord, if I give, I give just because you're just awesome. And you're loving and you're kind. And Jacob determines he's going to give simply because of the good things that God has done for him. He's a man of now of devotion. And every devotion, gang, listen, it it grows out of an appreciation of God. And and I understand that, you know, in the Christian life, there's two things. There's devotion and there's duty, isn't there? And and there's duty. We are called to do certain things, but you really have to do them out of devotion. And if you only sort of live an obligatory kind of life, And you forget about the goodness of God. You forget about the cross. You forget about how many times He's forgiven you and His patience towards you. Then it won't be enough to keep you going in terms of your duty. You'll fade away. But if you wake up every morning and remember that Jesus Christ died for you. For you. Not for mankind, but for Bill Smith. Well, that changes everything, doesn't it? When I remember that on that cross he said, it is finished. So it's not do, 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 it's done, done, done. See, now there's an appreciation. When I go to bed at night, before I put my head on my stony pillow, and I remember that Jesus Christ died for me, 
then there's an appreciation that goes with that too. And that's what keeps me going. Remembering the cross, remembering the cross, remembering the cross. Remember what Jesus Christ did. Anything less than that, you will eventually burn out. Or you'll have to hire cheerleaders around you to try to keep you going all the time. You've got to keep tight with Jesus. Remember the good things he's done. Remember the promises he's made. And remember this, gang, that the end of this life, life isn't over. It only just begins. This suffering that we experience is only temporary. Oh, sure, I want it to stop tomorrow. I know that. But if it goes on for another 25 years, so what? I will stand before him in glory. No longer a manipulator, no longer a cheater, no longer a prideful man, no longer a greedy man, no longer a self-centered man, but a redeemed man completely. And then life begins. Do you, do you get your mind around the eternality that stands in front of you? The goodness of God and that He put the staircase there. And sending His Son to die for us. That we could have eternal life in Him. Now, live your Christian life in light of that. Not obligation to any man. Not obligation to any denomination. Not obligation to any uh, liturgy per se. Just an appreciation for Jesus Christ who gladly and willingly went to the cross for you and for me. Amen? There's consequences to our actions, but there's encouragement along the way. And then there's a devotion that we have as we look at our Savior as well. Amen? So for you, I'm going to ask you tonight, consider the consequences of following Jesus. What are the consequences? What is the worst thing that could possibly happen to you in following Jesus Christ? That you get martyred. But if you're born twice, you'll only die once. Right? You're only born once, you'll die twice. Jesus said you must be born again. What is the worst thing that could happen? Some ISIS guy takes my, my head off out on a beach somewhere? Hey. At least it's on a beach, you know. <laughs> Consider the consequences of following Jesus. Eternal life. Encourage one another. Spurn one another on towards good works. A little encouragement goes a long way. Amen? And keep your devotion to the one. With a capital O. Keep your devotion to Him. Listen, your job wants you to be wholly devoted. Your boss wants you to be devoted to the bottom line. There's all kinds of things that are vying for your attention. The billboards want your devotion. The magazines. The websites. They all want your devotion. Let your devotion be to the one only. And you'll run your race well. Jacob will run his race well. He'll spend 20 years, but he'll be a good student. That's for sure. And he will come back. He will no longer be Yaakov. He'll be Israel. He will no longer be the cheater. He'll be governed by God. What a great eulogy to have. Was once a cheater now governed by God. I put that on, I change my name to Jacob. Just, if I die before you, don't even put Bill, just put Jacob. He was a cheater. I was, I was a thief. You guys didn't know that, did you? It's pretty good. But I'm governed by God now. That's the legacy I want to leave. I don't want to leave my name on some brick in some library somewhere. I want people to walk past my tombstone. And see that I was a redeemed person. That I started off pretty poorly running my race. But by the grace of God I will finish well. And you will too. Amen. 
Father, thank you. Lord, as we look at Jacob's life, Lord, as we'll glean out of his life over the next several weeks. Lord, we, may we remember that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever, Lord. That as you did a work in his life, you'll be faithful to do a work in ours. And that you even choose the most unlikeliest of people, Lord, for your glory. I pray for every one of us, Lord. That uh, some of us, well, some of us have experienced some pretty bad consequences for our decisions. But I thank you, Lord, that... Uh, that we haven't been disqualified. I thank you, Lord, that you do uh, encourage, Lord. You continue to remind us, Lord, week in and week out of your goodness and your mercy, Lord. May we not forget it, Lord, even this week as, as we head into difficult situations with employers and families and all kinds of different things. Help us to not forget that you are faithful to complete the things that you've started. Lord, I pray again, Lord, that our hearts will be wholly set on you, not partially set, not mostly set, but Lord, wholly set on you. And may we know the joy that comes, Lord, with that single-minded devotion. In Jesus' name, amen.